visitation immigration to Yahuda in the days of the Omer. Our keynote scripture is found in Ruth chapter one, verses six through seven. It states, then she arose with her daughter-in-laws that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that Yah had visited his people and giving them bread. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Yehuda. Tonight, this Tuesday, the May 9th, uh, we are two days away from the expiration of the immigration regulation called Title 42. Title 42 was put in place in 2020 to aggressively stop the flow of immigrants from South and Central America from coming in to America in order to stop the spread of COVID-19. It is uh, expected that when Title 42 uh, expires this Thursday, May the 11th, that many immigrants from South and Central America and Haiti will flood into America. Currently, as we speak, the mayor of Chicago, one of many what they call sanctuary cities for these immigration uh, people, uh, she has declared in this area a state of emergency. And I'm just going to play you a clip about this. And we're going to look at some things biblically as to any prophetic significance of these matters stand by. City stretched to the breaking point. Bear Lightfoot declared a state of emergency as the city handles new waves of migrants arriving in Chicago. She says 48 people arrived just today, sent on bus by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. CBS 2's Chris Ty was at the press event held by the mayor late today, and he is live at City Hall with what's next. Chris? Jim and Marie, let's put some numbers around this to try to walk through what is next. The mayor says since August, 8,000 8, asylum seekers have come to Chicago, about 100 to 200 a day. They come by bus, they come by plane, they come by foot. And she says that some of them are spending the night at police departments. Others are spending the night at the city's seven migrant shelters or three respite centers. But she says unless more money and more resources come soon, City Hall may need to call in the Illinois National Guard. She took aim at the Texas governor, Greg Abbott, saying he is doing all of this with zero humanity. She also had some sharp words for the Biden administration, upset that there's less money coming from FEMA this spring than came last fall, calling on Washington to help solve this problem. The city, she says, has looked at all available big box store sites, but says there needs to be places that can handle all the needs of these large numbers of people. Think bathrooms and kitchens. The mayor also wants work permits to be offered to these individuals so they can earn money to lessen the burden on the city. Bottom line, she doesn't expect these buses to stop arriving. We don't have any more space. I cannot emphasize that enough. And we can't live in a perpetual cycle of people coming in um, uh, from uh, cities in Texas um, with one-way plane tickets to Chicago, where they don't have sponsors, where they don't have a family network, and then ending up at our police station. That is not the way to go. So what does this emergency declaration really mean? It allows City Hall to spend money more dynamically to help those 8,000 people. The mayor says she has spoken to the team of Brandon Johnson to make sure they are up to speed on this matter as he takes over the fifth floor corner office next Monday. And bluntly, she said she was not expecting to have to do something like this in the final days of her administration. We're live at City Hall. Chris Ty, CBS 2 News. Thank you, Chris. So that's one report. I have another report to show you, another short, brief report. Uh, uh, some of the hotels, like in my neighborhood, uh, they are 
filling up the hotels, even out here in the south suburb that I live in. Uh, we're still in Cook County and Chicago is the county seat for us. So they're spending money here uh, in the county area as well in the suburbs for hotels. For the, for these people, they're filling up the hotels. Mr. Porter was barred from entering a $300 a night the hotel that is being used for migrant housing with taxpayers footing the bill. Here's hotel staff confronting the journalists. Watch this. Sure, this is a, well, why not? Because it's private. Well, no, this is a hotel. It's closed. You cannot it's closed? No, I just saw some people come, go inside. Yeah. You it's closed for well, why can't I come in? It's closed for you. Why is it closed for me? Why is it closed for me, though? I don't understand. This is a private area, so therefore it's private. You're not a resident here. The last Who are the residents? That Chicago reporter, William Kelly, joins me now. William, good morning to you. So we saw what happened, that exchange on the camera, but what was their excuse off the camera? What do they mean you're not a resident there? Well, Ashley, it, it, thank you for having me. It, it is very disturbing. This is right off of Michigan Avenue. We already have the, the retail is fleeing due to violent crime. Tourists obviously have flatlined in the city of Chicago. Hotels uh, are, are struggling. And this luxury hotel is apparently being used to house migrants. There's uh, There are a number of reasons why this is uh, alarming. One, the city of Chicago isn't talking about this at all. So Chicago residents are being com kept completely in the dark. Uh, the hotel itself, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions that I have as, as a resident, uh, as an investigator. Well, what, what are the code violations? What, what's the occupancy? What are uh, the, the lobby is uh, stacked to the ceiling with, yeah. the, with furniture and lamps, uh, you know, and, and, you know, we really have a ticking time bomb here. Something, you know, tragic could happen at the hotel. Something could spill out onto Michigan Avenue. We are entering Chicago's notorious murder season. Um, we already have a, a, an out of control crime problem. The police are understaffed and our new mayor doesn't seem to have a plan. No, you guys in Chicago are dealing with a lot right now. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I had a question, a follow up question. You All said right. in and then one more clip uh, from our people in the communities. They're turning schools into housing for uh, these the, uh, abandoned schools uh, for housing for the immigrants and uh, some of the Chicago residents in this in Woodline in the South Side are up in arms about this standby. Some of our people on the South Side. Debate tonight as Southside residents push back against plans to move in migrants in need of shelter. Anthony Ponce has more on the heated discussion in Woodlawn. Tonight's meeting was packed with many people not happy about the city's decision to go ahead and open up a shelter for asylum seekers without their input at a vacant elementary school campus here on the south side of the city. Now tonight, the city presented many of the specifics for the plan itself, but that still seemed to offer little comfort to many. I am, to say the least, freaking appalled at this fiasco. That Woodlawn resident among hundreds who showed up to vent similar feelings about the city's plan to open up a refugee shelter at the vacant Wadsworth Elementary School campus. I'm especially concerned about loitering as well as solicitation that may occur on the campus grounds. Chicago police joined leaders of the Department of Family and Support Services to provide details facility, the 11 p.m. curfew, the 24-7 security, the no drugs or alcohol policy, and the process for residents to provide input. But for most here, it was too little, too late. They didn't even tell us, the residents. They did not tell us anything until the last minute. We will work to make sure that we communicate clearly with our plans going forward. A recurring theme, what about the area's existing homeless? This is beautiful. To go in and get a shelter for people, to help these individuals come over here. What about the people who have been here for the last 20 years? 
the work that we're doing for new arrivals is not detracting from the regular work that the department is tasked to do. Final cleaning and final construction on the shelters expected to be done by the end of next week, with the first 250 residents expected to move in on January 23rd. The city says it's planning for the shelter to be open for two years, but that they are hoping it can close before then. On the south side, Anthony Ponce, Fox 32, Chicago. All right, so this is not just unique to uh, Chicago. This is happening in New York and other cities across America. Um, stand by. This is a problem happening all across America. Uh, it is prophetically interesting to note that this mass, mass migration is happening in these days of the Omer. It's re reaching a crescendo during the days of the Omer leading up to the Feast of Shavuot, particularly as Title 42 expires this Thursday, May 11th. In the Book of Ruth, which is read traditionally during the days of the Omer, which is the period between Passover and Shavuot. Uh, there is the account of a visitation by Yah to his people Israel, in which he restores their fortunes in their own land of Judah, which then compels them to return home from their exile abroad in the land of Moai. Uh, this annual review of the book of Ruth during this year's Days of the Omer has a very interesting parallel to current events taking place in the American exile community of Hebrew Israelites. This week, on May of the 11th, the US Immigration Law Title 42 which restricts immigration from Central and South American immigrants into the U.S. will expire this Thursday. Um, and this has awakened hope among these immigrants to now really move in larger numbers to America, uh, where some of them, and many of them, or most of them, are being placed by immigration authorities into the Hebrew slash black communities in America. For instance, in places like Chicago, these uh, immigrants are being moved to our people's neighborhoods as you just saw. Also in my South Side suburb, which is a black suburb, uh, the hotels in this community are being filled up with these immigrants as well. Uh, this is a pattern, as I've said, that's happening not just in Chicago, but in Black communities around the country. And the news isn't always reporting all of this. So as we review these matters, let, let's look at what this means uh, from this situation in light of the passages in Ruth chapter 1, verse 6 through 7, which again states, then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that Yah had visited his people and given them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Yahuda. Uh, let us review some points from this scripture that seem to harmonize with the current migration of immigrants from South and Central America into the Black slash Hebrew community in America. In the Ruth account, in chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, a family of Israelites immigrate from Atlanta exile in Moab, 
and they go to the habitation of the tribe of Judah. It is clear that primarily the Hebrews here in the U.S. are predominantly of the tribe of Judah and the house of David. For instance, Deuteronomy 28, verse 36 states, Yah shall bring you and your king, which you shall set over you, unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. Deuteronomy 28, 36 is dealing with the royal family of Judah, which is the house of David. The U.S. is that prophetic Babylon that parallels the historic Babylon in which Judah and the house of David were taken away captive in the times of King Nebuchadnezzar between 606 B.C. to 586 B.C. But the Deuteronomy 28 verse 36 passage states that they would be carried away to a land that they would not know, nor had they ever heard of before. Uh, the ancient Judean captivity to Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon was to a land they knew of. And in the days of King Hezekiah of Judah, Isaiah 39, chapter 39 shows that the kingdom of Judah of that time, around 700 BC, even had diplomatic relations with the ancient Babylon. So they knew of that Babylon. But in Deuteronomy 28, verse 36, the captivity of the royal Judean kingdom of Dawi is to one land, not to many lands. And it is a land that ancient Israelites never knew of. And it's clear that land is the United States. So the black community in the United States is primarily the royal Judean kingdom of Dawid. This is why it says in Deuteronomy 28, verse 36, you and your king would go to a land, a land, not land, a land that your fathers never knew about, that you've never heard of before. And they had never heard of a place called the United States uh, until we got here in slavery. So in the account of Ruth, the place that the exile family from Moab moves to is Bethlehem, which was where the family of the house of David would emerge from. As stated in verse 22 of chapter one of Ruth, it says, so Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Currently in these last days of the Omer, as we're closer now to the, the, the final completion of the days of the Omer, which climax with our gathering in South Carolina. So in the last day, in these last days of the days of the Omer, we're at the time of the beginning of the spring barley harvest. We're moving into that phase, which is the last days of the days of the Omer. Uh, and it was during that time that we see that some Israelites moved from Moab into the community that the house of God we would emerge from which was Bethlehem, hallelujah. So too, at this time in these latter days of the days of the Omer, could the mass, this mass migration of immigrants from South and Central America into our royal Judean neighborhoods of the so-called black community, could this be a prophetic sign that Yah is preparing for the royal kingdom of Dawi to emerge out of the black community uh, in America. Uh, it is certain that among these immigrants of South and Central America, 
there is a mixed multitude of Israelites in the midst of that who descend from Hebrew slaves into those countries. Uh, now, how much of these Israelites are, uh, it, it, it's very anecdotal to suggest, but it, it's clear that, that there has to be a significant number of Israelites in the midst of that mixed multitude coming up through the borders in Texas. Uh, who descend from Hebrew slaves brought into those countries in South and Central America. And their move to come into our neighborhoods follows a pattern of the migration of Israelites out of Moab to live in the midst of the royal Judean community of the house of David as shown in the book of Ruth. It is said of that time of that migration in verse six of chapter one, that Yah had visited his people in giving them bread. Today, at this time of the great awakening, Yah is clearly visiting and feeding his Israelite people in America with the bread of his word. As stated in Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse three, it states, and he humbled you and suffered you to hunger and fed you with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Yah doth man live. Yahshua our King and Savior was born in Bethlehem of the tribe of Yehuda. He declared in John chapter six, verses 31 through 35. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Yeshua said unto them, amen, amen, I say unto you. Moshe gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Abba giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of Elohim is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then Hallelujah. said unto him, Master, evermore give us this bread. And Yahshua said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Hallelujah. Get ready, Israel, for your redemption draws nearer. The kingdom of the house of Dawid must appear from among you in this U.S. captivity. It states, in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 36, that you and your king would go to a land you did not know. And then also in that day, Jeremiah chapter 50 verses four through five says, in those days and in that time, saith Yah, the children of Israel shall come and they and the children of Judah together going and weeping, they shall go and seek Yah, the Elohim. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, come and let us join ourselves to Yah in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Judah is here in the U.S. And it's very likely that the tribes of the kingdom of Israel are coming up from South and Central America to America, moving into the midst of Judah mm -hmm. in the US. Just as it said in verse four, of chapter 50 of Jeremiah, the children of Israel shall come. And it appears that coming up 
to you to join with Judah. And uh, it says Judah and Israel are to come together in Babylon, America, just before the second exodus. Are we seeing that happening now? These yeah. people are coming at such a rate and pace. It's as though it doesn't make sense how they're coming in and all the reasons that some are conspiring to let it happen. Nonetheless, it fits a pattern that clearly is what the scripture said would happen. It is very likely that among the South and Central American immigrants, there are descendants of the 10 tribes of Israel that must be joined with you, the royal tribe of Judah, in this land of the U.S. captivity just before our departure in the second exodus. Uh, the 10 tribes are to be brought to you, as said in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. The 10 tribes are to be brought to you, Yehuda, just before we leave together from America. It states in Genesis 49, 10, the scepter shall not depart from Yehuda, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall be the gathering of the people be. Of that time, leading up to our departure from America, Isaiah chapter 11 says, the enmity between Yehuda and the 10 tribes of the kingdom of Ephraim will be removed. And they shall return together as a great conquering army to the land of Israel. See, currently our people are complaining. Why are these people coming in among us? We got homeless people on the streets. Y'all not doing nothing to help them. Sure, I see the point and they make a good point. Yet nonetheless, somewhere in the mix of all this, Yah is moving. The hand of Yah is moving. And when he's doing this, this move is to show you and I that you draw closer to the time of the second exodus and you draw nearer to your return back home. I read again from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 13 and 14. It says of that day, the envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Yehuda shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Yehuda, and Yehuda shall not vex Ephraim, but they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Palestinians toward the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, which is the land of Jordan, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. That's the land of Jordan. These are those around your land. Also, Ezekiel says in chapter 37, verse, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 37, uh, verses uh, 15 through 28, it states, the word of Yah came again unto me, saying, moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companion, and join them one to another in one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith Yah Elohim, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Yosef, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. In Zechariah uh, chapter 12, Yah broke that stick of the unity between the house of Israel and the house of Judah. 
But now in Ezekiel 36, y'all said, I'm taking that stick that I broke and I'm putting it back together. And Jeremiah says, when Yah puts it back together of those other tribes in exile from those other lands, that then the time of the second exodus has at hand, continuing on. It says in verse 20 of chapter 37, and the sticks whereof thou writest shall be in thine hand before thy eyes. And say unto them, thus saith Yah Elohim, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them so they shall be my people, and I will be their Elohim. And Dawi, my servant, shall be king over them. And Yahshua is that Dawi who shall be king over us. And it says, and they all shall have one shepherd. And Yahshua is that shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Yaakov, my servant, when your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant Dawi, that's Yahshua, shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, Yah, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Hallelujah. 